Welcome to The Journey Church. My name is Jason Hatley, and I'm the lead pastor here at The Journey. I'm so glad that you're with me today as we continue this new teaching series about God's amazing grace. And if you're here today and you have a broken heart, if you're struggling today, if you're dealing with guilt or shame or fear or regret, then today's message is for you. Because today, we're going to look at one of the most amazing facets of God's grace, and that is God's healing grace. So if you haven't done so already, click that blue button by the live stream player so you can follow along with me in today's message. Now, as I was studying and preparing for today's message, I came across this list online, and it's not very scientific, but I thought it really applied since we're talking about healing grace today. And the list is the top ways that people get hurt. All right, so the top ways people get hurt, some of these actually really surprised me. Let me give you the list here. Number one, the number one way that people get hurt is they slip and fall. And yeah, that certainly happens here in South Florida. But if we're honest, this is why so many of us left the Northeast, so we don't have to deal with the snow and the ice and the slips and the falls anymore. Now, this second one, this is one that we all deal with here in South Florida because number two is distracted drivers. You know it. I know it. You see them everywhere. In fact, some of you right now are watching church online while you're driving. Stop that. Stop that. Pay attention to the road, okay? You can watch it when you get home. Uh, the third uh, top way that people get injured is through sports injuries. And some of you here today know the pain of sports injuries. Number four was the one that I thought was a little surprising and kind of odd. Number four is office accidents. I mean, how many people really get hurt at the office. I mean, what happened there? I mean, did you have like a runaway stapler? Did you get your tie caught in, in the copier? I'm not sure how that became uh, number four. But then number five is one that I have a little bit of experience with, and that is do-it-yourself projects. And uh, a few years ago, I decided I was going to trim the Christmas palm trees in front of my house, but they'd grown really tall. So I had this pole saw. It was basically about a 15-foot pole with a chainsaw on the end. I'm standing on a ladder holding a pole with a chainsaw on the end trying to trim these trees, and it dawns on me, Jason, this may be the dumbest thing you have ever done. So I decided to get down, you know, save all my limbs and just ask somebody to help me do that. But, you know, what's really interesting about this list is what's not on this list. Notice that the things that really hurt us, the, the scars that cut the deepest and stay with us the longest, are not on the list. Things like a broken heart, things like losing a job, or going through a, a career crisis or a financial crisis, emotional scars, a fractured marriage, a fractured family. I mean, these are the things that really hurt, right? These are the things that cause the most pain. And we all have problems. We all have pain. It's unavoidable in life. Some of you here today have hidden wounds, and other people can't see it on the surface, but they're real, and they hurt. One of the deepest hurts that we have is rejection. Rejection is painful, isn't it? You felt it. Maybe back in high school, or maybe in, in your uh, marriage right now, or maybe in your office. Rejection from a parent or from someone uh, that you're dating or a spouse or from a so-called friend. And some of you right now are thinking about a rejection that just happened recently and the pain of that is really fresh. But honestly, some of you are thinking about a rejection that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago and it stuck with you and it feels just as fresh today as the day that it happened. We don't let those hurts go easily, do we? So how do you handle hurts like that? How do you heal those kinds of scars that don't seem to want to go away? Well, that is where God's healing grace comes in. And that's what our memory verse for today is all about. So would you read this verse aloud with me from Psalm 147, verse 3? Let's read it uh, aloud together. Ready? Go. God heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Now, you may be thinking, hey, Jason, that sounds great. I have a broken heart. I have some hidden wounds in my life that need to be healed. But how in the world does God do that? How does God heal my broken heart? Well, in your notes, here's how. This is your first fill-in for today, so write this down. God heals my broken heart by changing the way I think. By changing the way I think. God heals your broken heart by changing your mind. By changing how you see God. 
by changing how you see yourself, by changing how you see the pain, by changing how you see other people, but most especially changing the way that you see you. And if you want to change your life, if you want to get well, if you want to get over that hurt, then we need to learn to change the way we think. You know, the Bible says that our beliefs determine our behaviors, that the things that we think about are the things that we act on. And the problem comes when your beliefs about God and the world and other people and yourself are distorted. I mean, let me give you an example of this. Have you ever been to a fun house before? You know, they have those fun house mirrors and you stand in front of them and they make you look goofy. They make you look tall. You know, they make you look skinny. They make you look like just weird and distorted. Well, when you look into a distorted mirror, what you're seeing is a distorted picture of yourself. You're, you're, it's not the real image. I mean, you can look at that and say, well, that's what's in the mirror, but that's not really who I am. And you know, the same is true when it comes to our lives. If you look in a distorted mirror, you see a distorted image of yourself. And the problem is that our beliefs oftentimes are like that mirror. Because if you have distorted beliefs, you're going to have a distorted image of yourself. The image of others will be distorted. Your image of God will be distorted. And your image of hurts and pains in life will even be distorted. And some of you here today, you have some warped, distorted beliefs, some false, misshapen, mistaken beliefs that you've picked up along the way. You know, somebody said something to you one time and you just accepted it as a fact, even though it wasn't true. You believed it and you're still acting on those beliefs that that person poured into you long ago. A parent or a coach or a teacher or an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend said something like, you know, you're never going to amount to anything or you're no good at that or or, this is not for you. And you filed that away and you believed it. Or maybe they said, you know, you're so dumb. Or, you know, can't you do anything right? And you filed all of that away in your mind. And because you believed it, it's become your reality. It's become the way that you see things. If you see yourself as a loser, then you're probably going to lose more often than not. If you see yourself as a victim, then you're going to act like someone who's always a victim. If you see yourself as a failure, well, you're probably going to fail. And that's why if you want to get rid of these distorted images and these distorted beliefs that we have about ourselves, we need to experience God's healing grace. And God's healing grace starts by changing the way that we think, the way that we see ourselves, by replacing those faulty beliefs that someone else put in your head with God's truth about who you really are in Christ. So here's the big idea today. I want you to begin to see yourself not as those distorted beliefs portray you, but rather as you really are, the way that God sees you. So how do you do that? How do you make this change? Well, it starts not by changing yourself, but by changing the way you think, by letting God do this work of healing grace in your life. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Notice it doesn't say just think more positive thoughts or, or just, you know, practice these mental models and that, and then you're going to be able to fix all this by yourself. You know, those things can be good, but that's not where the power is. The power lies with God. Let God transform the way you think. And if God transforms you the way that you think, you will begin to see things as they really are. So today, let's explore five biblical beliefs about you that God says are true. And let me tell you something about God. God never lies. So these truths that I'm going to teach you today about who you really are, about how God really sees you, you can take it to the bank. These are true. And if you can grasp these five truths today, This could be one of the most important days in your life where you don't just uh, understand these truths, but you really believe them and you begin to live them and begin to act on them. So if you need God's healing grace today, this message is for you. And maybe you say, Jason, I don't really have a problem with this today. Well, trust me, your day is coming. There's going to come a time, probably not too long from now, where you're going to need these truths about God's healing grace. So be sure to take good notes and let's talk about how God sees me because 
of His grace. Here's the first way in your notes that God sees me because of His grace. God sees me when he, and He says, I am acceptable. I am acceptable. Now, I start with this because this is usually one of the biggest challenges that we face. We spend our entire lives trying to be accepted and acceptable in the eyes of others. We want to be accepted by our parents, by our friends, by our peers, by our professors. We want to be even accepted by our enemies, by the people that we envy, and even by people that we don't even know, absolute total strangers. You know, most of us don't realize just how much this drives all of the choices and decisions that we make in life, this need to be accepted. It influences the way that you think. It influences the way that you speak, the way you act, the way you dress. It influences your friends. It influences where you want to live and what kind of car you want to drive and what kind of clothes you want to wear. People will do the craziest things just to feel accepted. And you've seen it, and I have too, especially in this social media world in which we live where people do unbelievable things to themselves and to others just to try to feel accepted. Do you remember as a kid when someone would dare you to do something? You knew it was dumb. You knew it, this was a stupid thing to do, but you did it anyway. Now, why did you do that? You did it so that you would be accepted by your friends. You wanted people to like you. But isn't it true that even if you do everything perfect in life, some people are still not going to accept you or like you. Think about Jesus. He was perfect, and yet people rejected him. And listen, you're going to be rejected in your life too. Someone is going to turn their back on you. Someone is going to talk about you behind your back. Someone's going to tell you that you're not good enough, and it's going to hurt. That's why it's so important that you never forget this first truth. Through God's amazing grace, I am acceptable. Look at how acceptable you are to God in Romans 15, 7. It says, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Now, notice in this verse, there's no condition. There's nothing that you have to do. There's nothing where you have to say, well, I've got to go clean up my life so that God will accept me, or you know, Jesus uh, will accept me if I just go to church every week. It, it doesn't say Jesus will accept you if you're perfect and good all the time. No, it's unconditional because there's no way for us to be perfect, and that means that God's grace, God's acceptance, it's based on Him and His character, not on me and my performance. And if, you're, if you've become a follower of Jesus, you know, we oftentimes talk about how you have accepted Christ, but let me give you the flip side of that. When you become a follower of Jesus, not only do you accept Christ into your life, but get this, Jesus accepts you, not because you deserve it, not because of all the good things you've done, but because of His healing grace. Even with all of our hang-ups and habits and, and the difficult and, and the terrible decisions that we make sometimes, God has chosen you. That's what the Scripture tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He writes, for you are a chosen people. Circle that word chosen. God chose you. You are a chosen people. You are royal priest. Underline that phrase, royal priest. A holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into this wonderful light. Now look up here for just a moment. Because if you depend on the acceptance of others, you are always going to be let down because no one, uh, nobody is ever going to just fully accept you. But through God's grace, God says, I don't reject you. I accept you. And if you believe that truth, it's going to bring so much peace and so much joy and so much security to your life. God says, through Jesus, I accept you. But God doesn't stop there. In fact, let's go on now to the second way that God sees us because of his healing grace. The second truth is this, I am valuable. I am valuable. You are valuable because of God's grace. You have great worth. Now, how much do you think you're worth? You ever think about that? Not your net worth, not how much money is in your investments or your retirement or your bank account, not your net worth, but your self-worth. How much do you think you are worth? Uh, you might say, Jason, that's a really hard question. I mean, how do you determine uh, the value of a person? Well, there are two things in life that we use to determine something's 
value. First, uh, value is determined by who owns it, by who owns it. Ownership determines value. And, and, uh, you know, something that's owned by a celebrity is worth far more than something that's owned by me. For example, if I were to take off my shoes and give you my shoes, first of all, you would say, ooh, gross. (laughs) But then you would say, uh, this is pretty worthless. You'd probably throw them out. But did you see where recently Michael Jordan's shoes that he wore in the 1998 NBA Finals, they were auctioned off at over $2 million. Over $2 million. Now, what's the difference between those shoes and my shoes? Well, the difference is who owns them? Who owned those shoes? Because the owner adds a lot of value to that which is owned, depending on who the owner is. So the question is, who do you belong to? Well, 1 John 4, 4 answers that question. The the scripture says, but you belong to God. Underline that phrase, you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. You see, you belong to God. That means that you are priceless. You are valuable because you belong to God. Now, the other thing that determines value is what someone is willing to pay for it, okay? So it depends on what someone is willing to pay for it. For example, right here with me today, this is a 1961 Fleer Babe Ruth baseball card. This actually belonged to my dad. He collected this uh, when he was young, and then he's passed this on down to me. Now, how much do you think my 1961 Fleer Babe Ruth baseball card is worth? Well, we could look online somewhere and try to search it. We could take it to an auction house or a collector and see what they would, they would say the value of it is. But let me tell you the real way to determine the value of this card. The value of this card is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for it. And if someone is only willing to give me $2 for my Babe Ruth baseball card, then guess what? The value of this card is only $2. It's only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So how valuable are you? Well, let's look at how much God paid for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, it says, God paid a high price for you. So don't be enslaved by the world. So what is that high price that God paid for you? It was the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the highest price imaginable for you. He laid down his life for you when he died for you on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. That means that you have incredible, incalculable value. And if you ever doubt your value, because someone tells you that you're not good enough or you're not worth it, don't you believe it because it's not true. If you want to know your value, you look at the arms of Jesus stretched out on the cross because that's what God was willing to pay for you. You are infinitely valuable. Jesus proved it on the cross. So don't let anyone ever tell you anything different. So God's healing grace is so powerful in our lives because through his healing grace, not only am I acceptable, not only am I valuable, but next in your notes, I am lovable. I am lovable. Just say those words out loud with me right now. Ready, go. I am lovable. Feels really good to say that, doesn't it? It especially feels good to say that when you have a broken heart, when someone else has not loved you. When someone else has rejected you, maybe a a, a boss or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a spouse or a parent, whoever it is, and you feel like nobody loves me. But if you ever think that, if you ever say that to yourself, you just need to stop because you're wrong. Somebody does love you. God loves you. Let's look at God's amazing love. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10, it says, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then... My faithful love for you will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Now, there's two characteristics of God's love that distinguishes it from human love that we find in this verse. Maybe just jot this down in the margin of your notes. First of all, God's love is consistent. God's love is consistent. His love never ends. You know, even the best human love is inconsistent. People say, I'll love you when I feel like it, 
I'll love you when I'm in the mood to. I'll love you uh, when I'm having a good day. But God's love is not fickle. God's love is consistent. It's unchanging. God is not constantly changing his mind about how he feels about you. He's not saying, uh, you know, today, oh, I like you today. But then tomorrow, oh, I'm in a bad mood. I don't like you anymore. That's not how God is. God is not unpredictable. He says, there's nothing that you could ever do to make me love you more or less than I already love you because God's love is consistent. But then also in this verse, we see that God's love is unconditional. It's unconditional. In other words, it's not based on my performance or on my behavior. It's not based on me measuring up. It's unconditional. Now, let's be honest. This is really hard for us to wrap our minds around because we grew up experiencing conditional love. We grew up and we've experienced in our life, you know, moments where we've heard or felt people say, I'll love you if you do this. I'll love you if you love me first. I'll love you if you attain this mark or this success in life. But if you fail to meet any or all of those conditions, then forget it. I don't love you. But God says, I love you period. Not if, period. No conditions, no qualifiers, just grace. That's God's love for you. You don't have to wonder, oh, does God love me? You can know it for sure today. God loves you. God says, by grace, I am acceptable. I am valuable. I am lovable. And then back in your notes next, here's the fourth truth. I am forgivable. I am forgivable. And I'll be honest, this is one that I really need because I mess up and I make a lot of mistakes. You know, sometimes when we get hurt, when we fail or when we have a hard time, we fall into some bad theology. And we think that we must have done something wrong, so now God is out to get us. God God is, you know, after us now. You know, like the guy who gets fired from his job, And then on his way home, uh, he runs out of gas, so he has to walk the rest of the way home. And then while he's walking, you know, one of those big spring uh, South Florida rain showers comes, and he gets totally soaked. And then when he gets home, and he he finds out that while he was at work that day, his house had burnt to the ground, and he cries out in frustration, God, why me? God, why me? And God, you know, and then he hears this voice from the heavens that says, you know, because some people just really tick me off. You know, that's how some of us here today view God. You think that God is like that. Or maybe you're a Christian and anytime something goes wrong in your life, you think, boy, God is mad at me. Why is God always mad at me? He's punishing me for something stupid that I did. But listen, is that really how God is? Is that really how God responds to his children? No, that's not the nature of our loving God. Isaiah 43, 25 reveals God nature, God's nature. God says, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and will never think of them again. That's God's grace. It's not based on you deserving it. It's based on who God is. It's based on what Jesus did for you on the cross. It's based on the very nature, the very character of your loving heavenly father. Not based on you or me, but it's based on God's love. In fact, just out to the side of Isaiah 43, 25. I want you to just write this in. Write, God doesn't hold grudges. Because he doesn't. God doesn't hold grudges. God says, I'm not going to hold your sin against you. That's when you receive Jesus and saving grace into your life. I'm not going to hold your past sins against you. Some of you feel like God is just constantly mad at you that God is against you. But can I just tell you today, God is not against you. God is for you. God is for you. Look, if you've received God's saving grace, and you're a follower of Jesus, then every sin that you've ever committed and every sin that you ever will commit is forgiven. The scripture says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But don't forget, While there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, if you reject God, if you reject Christ, then you condemn yourself. You condemn yourself. But before you were even born, God says, that's not what I want for you. Before you were even born, God says, I know all the sins that you will commit, and God still made you, and God still loves you, God still cares about you, God still longs to forgive you if you will open your heart 
to his saving and healing grace. And I can prove it to you. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 in your notes. Let's read this verse aloud together. Are you ready? Go. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Isn't that great news? That when I receive Jesus into my life, all of my sins are wiped away, past, present, and future. God says, I'm acceptable. I'm valuable. I'm lovable. I am forgivable. And then let me give you one final truth for the way that God sees you because of his healing grace. Number five, I am capable. I am capable. You know, when you get hurt, like we saw at the beginning of the message, that top five list, maybe you slip and fall, or maybe you're like me and you take your life into your own hands by holding a chainsaw at the end of a 15-foot pole trying to trim your palm trees, you know, or even if it's just because you're going through a tough time, a difficult time at work or a breakup, or, you know, oftentimes we think, man, I can't do anything right. I'm such a screw up. I'm never going to get my life in order. But this is where God wants to transform your thinking. He wants to transform that through his healing grace. And it reminds us that in Christ, I am capable. Look at this next verse, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Let's read this verse aloud together. Are you ready? Go. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, we're going to read this verse a second time. This time, I want you to read it twice as loud, and I want you to read it like you really believe it. Okay, are you ready? Go. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Maybe today you don't feel very capable. Maybe you don't feel very strong. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote those words, he didn't either. He was sitting in a prison. He was in a weak and powerless position. But you see, God had changed the way that Paul thought. And Paul knew that God was greater than the predicament he found himself in. And like Paul, you're not going to make it through this life without pain and problems and unforeseen predicaments too. So let God transform the way that you think. Like Paul, let go of all of those distorted beliefs about who people have said you are and the ways that people have torn you down in the past and start thinking about yourself and seeing yourself through God's eyes of grace. Begin filling your mind with God's uh, irrefutable truth. God says, I, I will give you the strength that you need. You may not be capable, but I am. I will help you. And, and through Christ, you can do everything. Some of you have had some major hurts in your life, and you're carrying the scars and the hidden wounds from those hurts right now, that pain of rejection from your past. And can I just say as your pastor, I am truly and deeply sorry for that. I am. It, it, it's it's un conscionable sometimes what we do to one another and how we hurt one another. But can I also say to you that your heart can be mended. God can heal your broken heart. If you will open your life to the grace of God, receiving Jesus as your Savior and Lord, if you've never done that before, but also receiving God's healing grace. I also want you to know that you have a church family right here at The Journey that cares about you. And if you don't have a church home to, to rally around you and to support you, I invite you to make the journey your church home so that you can find healing and hope and value from the people that God has put in this amazing family here at the journey. You see, when life hurts, and it will hurt, the bottom line is, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe those distorted images that somebody else said about you or that you've even been saying about yourself for years in your mind? Or are you going to believe what your loving, gracious, heavenly Father says about you? I hope that you will believe what God says for you. In fact, here's my prayer for you. It's our final verse from Romans 15, 13. It says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads right now and let's pray together. Let's thank God for His healing grace. Heavenly Father, today, I pray that you would take those distorted thoughts and images that we've put into our minds about who we are and what we're worth. And God, I pray that you would just remove it. Remove it by your grace. 
words that others have spoken, rejection that others have thrown at us, hurts that we've been carrying around, lies that we've been believing. God, remove them completely in Jesus' name. Father, change the way we think. Help us to see us as you see us through eyes of grace, as acceptable and valuable and lovable and forgivable and capable. Help us to begin living the life you created us for. And then for those of you who are here today, some of you have never said yes, first of all, to God's saving grace by inviting Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of all of your mistakes and mess ups and to give you new life and purpose today and a home in heaven. If that's you, then right now, would you open your heart to receive God's grace today? Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, today I stop running. I stop believing all the lies that the world has told me. And today I surrender to you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again on the third day, defeating death so that I could have eternal life with you in heaven, but also the abundant life that you've promised here on earth. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I don't want to keep living apart from you anymore. I want to follow you from this day forward in the fellowship of your church. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen.